Hello and welcome to the second part of this multi-part series on PFAS analysis. Uh, today I'll be talking about something we call mass defect, both nuclear mass defect and molecular mass defect. Hopefully by the end you all know the difference. We ended part one talking about uh, mass spectrometry of PFAS, um, specifically this P-phosphorus, uh, and we ended with a question of why do all their exact masses end in 0.9? So if we go back to this mass spectrum, you see 498.93, see 499.93, 500.92, and it's not just PFAS, it's other PFAS too. Um, a lot of them end in 0 0.9. Um, and I get this question a lot because uh, it's important and a lot of people say the mass defect of fluorine um, and a lot of people don't really understand why. Um, and the PFOSERUS here, the PFOSERUSes are confused. And their logic is, well, don't most natural compounds end in 0.1 or 0 0.0 or 0.2 or 0.3? And yes, that's correct. And if you do mass spectrometry, you'll see that a lot of things are 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. Um, but uh, look at what, how they asked it, though. Don't most natural compounds? So that's a little clue here. So sugar, 180.06, ethanol, 46.04, and then octane sulfonate, which would be the non-fluorinated version of these p phosphoruses, um, 193.09. Notice that none of them have a 0.9 um, mass. So why are they so different? Um, and the, the, the clue here is that they are not natural compounds. So we're going to figure out what makes their um, mass different and we will need to go into a special topic called PFAS nuclear physics. Um, and I am not a nuclear physicist, physician? I, I think it's physician. Um, but I, I am not a nuclear physicist, uh, but some of these concepts really help you understand uh, why the mass and why the mass defect is the way it is. So we're going to start out just with our PFOS is asking, well, they, they all have eight carbon, um, they're PFOS, so how much does carbon weigh? And you may know this, but you may not have gone through this little exercise. So carbon 12, um, what this means is carbon 12 has six neutrons, six protons, and six electrons. Um, and maybe carbon-13 would have seven neutrons, but we'll stick with carbon-12, right? Uh, and so the mass of carbon-12 should be, theoretically, the weight, so the mass of all those electrons plus the mass of all the neutrons plus the mass of all the protons. So if we take those individual masses and we start to add them up, what we get is... Um, 6.05, 6.04, 0.003, we add them together, and we came up with carbon-12 weighing 12.098939,4 Daltons. Um, the sum of all its parts, right? Uh, matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So is that correct? No, it's wrong. Um, even though matter cannot be created or destroyed, we have some other interesting things going on here. The mass of carbon-12 in reality is 12.0000000. And why? Well, for one thing, the Dalton is normalized to carbon, so of course it's 0000. 000, 000, 000, 000. But with other compounds as well, our calculated masses are not the same as the measured mass, or what we'd say the, the exact mass. Um, so, so why is it this way? This is what we're going to talk about. Um, and it's because of this guy. Anybody recognize this guy? Uh, you may recognize more in this picture. Um, the first picture was from 1905. This picture, I think, was the 1930s. Um, Albert Einstein came up with E equals MC squared. So meaning that um, all energy has mass and all mass has energy. I think that's how this goes. Um, and we use it in this context in, as the context of nuclear binding energy. Um, so if you take his formula um, and use one Dalton as the mass, and then use C, which is the speed of light, we come up with an energy of 930.1.5 mega electron volts per Dalton. So that means per Dalton of stuff we have has that much energy. This is a bit abstract to think about, but it comes into play very easily with what we were just discussing. 
So what we were just discussing, the calculated mass we came up with of carbon, 12.0989, which I said was incorrect because our actual mass was 12.0000. So the difference in those two is 0 0.0989394. That difference had to go somewhere, right? We didn't destroy protons. We didn't shave off part of the neutrons. What happens is, is there's a separate force when things get really, really close together. Um, this nuclear force um, that causes nuclear fusion, quantum tunneling, a bunch of things I don't understand. Um, but what it means is to pull those, to pull that nucleus together, it takes energy. That energy causes the mass to be lower. The more energy, means the more mass is lost, the bigger mass defect. So this is the nuclear mass defect. For carbon, um, if we convert that lost Daltons into um, energy, so by multiplying by the energy per Daltons, that's 92.1 mega electron volts. Compared to other things, um, as you go up the periodic table to a certain point, um, that gets higher and then it starts to get lower. It's a very interesting kind of nuclear physics that I'm not going to get into right now. But practically what we see is different elements have different mass defects. And you can tell this by looking at their exact mass. Look at hydrogen, 1.00783. Um, but look at oxygen, 15.9949. So with different uh, elements here, as the binding energy for that specific element increases, the nuclear mass decreases um, following e, e, e equals mc squared, right? So let's go through this exercise for fluorine. Um, the actual fluorine mass is 18.9984. We have nine electrons, nine protons, 10 neutrons. So we get a calculated mass of 19.15707. Um, that's, a, that's a bigger difference than carbon. That's a mass defect now, a difference of 0.15867 for a binding energy of 147.8. So the binding energy for fluorine is higher, so the mass defect is larger, pushing that um, Dalton mass below its integer value. So the mass number is the integer value. Fluorine 19 would be the integer, but instead we're 18.9984. So the more negative you get, the more, the you know, further, below that integer value means there was there had to have been more binding energy to get that low. So that's what's special about fluorine. Um, this is the chart showing uh, across the periodic table the number of nucleons. So nucleons are protons plus neutrons. So as that increases, we have more nuclear binding energy up to the point of iron, and then it starts to drop off. Um, and then at a certain point, you start to actually release energy with nuclear fission. This is how um, atomic energy, atomic weapons work. Uh, it's a fascinating stuff that, again, I'm not going to get into because I don't fully understand it. Finally, again, practically what this means is that when we are building molecules and trying to calculate the mass of a molecule or back calculating the formula from a mass, we can use this exact mass to our advantage to help us understand what it's made of. And where, how this will work is if you have a compound whose mass, energy mass would be XXX, right? It could be 498, 499, 300, input whatever number, but it would go 300.8, 300.9, 301.0, 301.1. .1. Um, to figure out kind of what makes up that mass, if you have more fluorine, that pushes us down to the 0 0.9, 0 0.8 direction because we're adding a bunch of 18.99s together. If you have um, more carbon, it's actually, I have the arrow going to the right, but if you look at it, you'll know that that is incorrect. The more carbon, the arrow should be going neutral. It's, it's not, it doesn't matter for the mass defect. Um, whereas for hydrogen, we're going to the right. Oxygen, we're going to the left. Who made these slides anyway? Um, uh, but uh, so hopefully that gets you a, an idea of you know, why we cover mass defect, why people talk about mass defect with fluorine. It's because mainly when you replace hydrogens who have a positive mass defect with fluorines who have negative mass defect, you know, below in the integer, um, you start to really affect the mass of that molecule and it's characteristic. It's easy to spot in a mass spectrometer. Um, 
I hope that makes sense. In the next episode, we're going to go more into the analysis of PFAS, including some fragmentation, that sort of stuff. Um, and this should provide you a good basis for, for learning about mass and how we see things in the mass spectrometry world. And thanks for listening. Be sure to comment if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. Um, and we'll see you next time. Bye.